Doug, we are live, I think, according to the screen. I think we are. Well, welcome Indianapolis Motor Speedway fans and friends of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Museum. We're pretty excited to be coming to you tonight with our 1985 Indianapolis 500 winner, Danny Sullivan. But before we get started, I do want to go through a few things so that you all are familiar with what's going to happen here. Um, everybody will be put on mute when they come in the room. So uh, you can watch us and you don't have to worry about what you're saying in the living room that we're going to hear it. So you guys are, are on mute. And that also wants you to know that if you're trying to ask us a question, we can't hear you uh, because you're on mute. If you're having any kind of problems tonight, you can always reach out uh, to Julie Hyatt. That's jhyatt at brickyard.com. So J-H-I-A-T-T -T at brickyard.com. And she'll do the best she can to as quickly as she can uh, solve any issues that you might have. You know, this is the fourth one of these that the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Museum has done. And if it were a normal year, we'd be doing a lot of these in person at, this, at the museum. I, I say that only to tell you that the museum is a foundation. It's separate from the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, and it survives on your support, your donations, and your efforts. So if you can go to uh, the museum's website, we would really appreciate you becoming members of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Museum. They are the caretakers of the history of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Those cars that you see tell unbelievable stories, and without folks like you participating alongside the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Museum and the foundation, we can't tell those stories. So thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, thanks for being part of this. You know, as I think most of you know, the museum right now is closed as we've been dealing with COVID. The museum made the decision to close until shortly after Thanksgiving. So stay tuned there to see if we can reopen uh, the museum following Thanksgiving. But remember, we've got some great exhibits there. We'll talk a little bit more about those uh, before we close to remind you that you wanna come see uh, the Granatelli exhibit. You also wanna see from the vault exhibit and we'll talk a bit about mo uh, more about that at the end. But right now, let's get started with why we're all here. It's uh, exciting when we get an opportunity to talk to uh, one of our favorite Indy 500 winners. One of the most magical stories in Indy 500 lore is that victory that uh, Danny had in 1985. But if I were introducing him, there's a whole lot of ways you could introduce Danny Sullivan. Taxi cab driver, lumberjack, TV personality, actor, a whole ton of things that Danny Sullivan has done across his career and continues to do. And that's what makes him, I think, one of our favorite Indy 500 winners is the combination of that unbelievable win and then all of the things that he's done outside of the race car really to elevate our sport and continues to do to this day. So Danny, uh, thanks for taking a little bit of time and spending time with us. Welcome uh, to Indiana from California. Well, thanks, Doug. It's always good one to talk to you also to represent the uh, Indianapolis Museum. Uh, by the way, for everybody that's listening, if you haven't been to the museum, it is so special. I go there every year that I'm back there and there's such there's there's such history there. Make it a make it a point and make it a stop, okay? But Doug, thank you. It's great to be back here and and uh, out here in California and and what a weird year. <laughs> it it has definitely been a weird year. You know, we asked fans to uh send some questions in. So we're going to get to some of those um, as we go over the course of the next uh, 50 minutes or so, uh, spending time with you. But you and I chatted a little earlier, and I thought it might be fun to, to just pick on some stories um, throughout your career that aren't necessarily the stories that those of us who are hardcore fans have heard before, although we want to hear a few of those while we're here. But I thought I might start with um, a few obscure ones. Uh, and I know you're such a good storyteller and there's some, some fun stuff around them. But in your era of racing, uh, a lot of drivers got to the Indianapolis 500 and got to the, the PPG IndyCar series um, through Can-Am cars. And you actually had a chance to drive Can-Am cars. You won at Caesars Palace in a Can-Am car. Can you talk a little bit about just how, the craziness? We see those today in vintage races, the horsepower, the size of those cars, just really romantic cars in a lot of ways. Talk about what it was like to drive one of those cars just a rung below getting to the IndyCar series. Well, the Can-Am for me was just a, a fabulous series. Of course, back in the day, you know, they made, I don't know, 500 horsepower or something like that. But that was a lot of horsepower in those days. And uh, they had a lot of downforce because of the body work. They were fun to drive. Every, you could lean on the other drivers. So it was really close racing, all road courses. And uh, what, a, what a list of drivers that competed in it from Al Jr., Al Sr., uh, Patrick Tombe, you might remember, uh, Keke Rosberg, um, Bobby Ray. I mean, the list just goes on and yep. on. And so the racing, Al Holbert, the late great Al Holbert was a, was a champion. So the racing was, was fantastic. 
but probably for me in that era was one of the most fun series because you'd race hard Sunday night because everybody wasn't zooming off and going to sponsors or making a, a plane or this, that, and the other. All the teams, all the personnel, all the crews, everybody, even the corner workers, everybody, they'd have a party afterwards. Paul Newman had the Budweiser team. So Budweiser supplied the beer. My backer during a lot of it was Garvin Brown. So there was Jack Daniels everywhere. Um, you know, there was a big barbecue and it was just a really festive way to end the weekend and win or lose. Everybody had a great time. It was, it was a fabulous series. So, so you um, went at Caesars Palace and you'd, you'd been over in Europe and you come back and you do the Can-Am series and you have an opportunity to run a year in Formula One. Uh, you had a couple of really bright moments there, finishing fifth at Monaco, I think, and then, yeah. and then your race of champions. Maybe talk a little bit about both of those. Running at Monaco, even if you're just an IndyCar fan, we like to tune into that on Indy 500 Sunday usually because it's just such a unique event. It has the history like the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Maybe talk a little bit about that and then – Tell us a little bit about that Race of Champions event that you almost picked up a win in uh, your first year over there. Well, I did the Race of Champion first. It was my third race. And I got a call from Tyrrell on like Tuesday afternoon in California and said, hey, listen, uh, your teammate, Michele Alboreto, can't do the race. So can you get over here and do the race? I said, isn't it this weekend? And he goes, yeah. So that meant I flew on Wednesday, got there on Thursday, and practice was Friday morning. And, you know, coming from California, big time change. But um, anyway, it, it worked out. And I qualified okay. And the past world champion, Alan Jones, was in it. A lot of people were in this race. And the funny part is going at the start, and I've raced at Brands Hatch a hundred times because I used to live across the street. So I knew the track well. And I got a start, and the, the grid is off camber a little bit. And you go up to Paddock Bend. And you, you got to be really careful. And it's a really fast off camber downhill right hander. And I got punted from behind. And I swerved to miss, I think it was John Watson or <laughs> and I swerved and I went all the way around the outside of about three cars going down through Paddock Bend. I was scrambling to save the car and I made this pass moved up quite well. It got up in the top three or four and then, and then the race went on and I caught Rosberg toward the end. And again, at Paddock Bend, we went around and around side by side up in the Druids, the hairpin. And I got around him on the outside and he opened the door on me and kind of squeezed me onto the grass coming off of it. And, and uh, but I, I lost it by a nose, but that, that was my first F1 race. So, it was a pretty special deal. I think also I had been out the night before with a buddy and I think <laughs> a little bit later than I probably should. And, you know, I had went to Indian Nosh and so it was one of those deals. But the next, then I had one or two other, then I came to Long Beach, had a good race there. It was actually in front of John Watson who went on to lead it and something broke on the car. But when I got to Monaco, and I'd driven some big cars and stuff like that, but Monaco, the streets are one narrow anyway, but when you come through Sandoval, that's the one that goes up the hill before into the casino square, you're going up there, you know, even back then 160, 170 miles an hour, and it is this wide. <laughs> really, we're in a Formula One car going up there. But in the race, like, so I qualified dead last, it rained on qualifying, so our practice up, held up, they used to qualify twice back then, held up. I got in the race. Neither Nicky Louder or John Watson and the McLarens qualified. So I'm last on the grid. It's raining. And I'm talking, it's raining. It's not misty. It's raining. And Ken Tyrrell comes up to me and he says, which tires do you want? And I was, I was about to say, you know, make some rude comment about really. And he goes, that's what I thought. So we're putting slicks on them because it's going to start. It's going to dry out. And in those days, they didn't do pit stops. Okay. And I look over and Elio DeAngelis is in the JPS uh, Lotus. And he looks over and he kind of goes, are you crazy? Slicks? Are you crazy? It's raining. And um, it was the scariest first five laps ever. You know, you're just tiptoeing around, but guys were starting to slide off and crash. And I ended up not having to make a pit stop and came through from last and finished fifth. And um, 
and got my first world championship points. Remember in those days, it only went to points only went to six plays. So that was a pretty good opening for me. And Formula One was fantastic. And I would have liked to stay there, but the um, uh, Doug Cherson made an offer and yep. Terrell lost the sponsorship for Benetton. And he said, well, I'm not gonna be able to tell you until February. And I went to the last, you know how they had the last race at Phoenix at, at, toward the end of the year. And I went by there on the way home and Doug said, hey, Howdy Holmes is gonna retire would you be interested in driving for me for next year? And I didn't, to be honest with you, Doug, everybody knows what the Indy 500 was. I, I grew up 120 miles south of there. I mean, I knew what it was, but I didn't really know much about kart racing. It was kart back in the day, but in those days, I'd done almost all my racing in Europe. And so I didn't really follow it. So I was like, um, sure, <laughs> you know, cause it was, and, and uh, a late night decision and Doug was fantastic. I ended up winning three races in that first year and it was uh, just transformed, you know, my career. So talk a little bit about that first year in 1984, Doug Shearson, you come in, you do win three races, which is pretty remarkable having not been in the cars, but I think maybe even more remarkable, you would have thought you would have been really competitive on the road course and the street courses, but all of this, you pick up a win and not just an oval, but at Pocono in a 500 mile race, your first year here on the state side, what's, how, and, how hard was it to adapt to that? And San Air. Well, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm short of, I've yep. done, I've done, I've done Atlanta in 82 um, uh, for Foresight and I've done a couple races and I got to tell you, I was, I was lost. And I'm, I'm walking up to go qualify and I saw Big Al, Unser, and I said, Big Al, I said, hey man, I, I need some help. I'm, I'm way back, I don't have any idea. He says, you're driving this like a road race car, car, a road racer. You're braking going into the corner. He says, you gotta carry the throttle all the way down into the middle of the corner and roll out and you know, pick up the power and go like that. So I took, he told me to take three, I didn't even know you could take three warm up laps. So I asked Wally Dollenbach, and he says, okay. And so I did the, at that time, the, the Cosworth rev to like 10,800. I did 7,000 the first lap, 8,000 the next. Third warm up lap was 9,000. I think, okay, I got this. And I went in there and I ended up qualifying 10th and I finished third in the, in the race. And it was for a long time, it was the highest finish by a rookie. But if it hadn't been for Big Al, and going back to the Can-Am, my relationship with him from the Can-Am days and getting to know him and, and, and him racing against me, I would, have never done, I would have never done it. For those guys, the first time I went to well, Milwaukee, I had, and it was rough back then. Remember, it was a really rough circuit. And Al, um, who was it? Oh, AJ came out of turn two and I rolled out of the throttle a little bit. I mean, he was going to catch me anyway, but I just rolled out and tucked in behind him. I followed him for two laps, followed, it got further and further back, but, it was <laughs> long. but I learned more how to drive an oval from those guys and following and, and learning and watching what they did than anybody else. That Pocono, the Pocono was an interesting deal because at the last lap, I had mirrors right behind me and Rick is, is, is good, if not the best ever to drive, you know, on those ovals and 500 miles. And I'm in that car and, and we were coming on a back marker going through three. And I just thought I, I'm going to have to take this corner flat from, from the turn two all the way down. Rick did the same thing. We split the car coming off of <laughs> the last corner and I beat him by whatever the, you know, half a car length or something like that. But what I was telling you that story is, I think right then, that's one of the reasons that Penske uh, contacted me to see if I'd signed a contract with Shearson was because not only did I win a 500 miler, but I beat Rick Mears in a fair race. And, and you, know, I, you know, Rick, and I say this honestly, he was, he was as good, if not the best there was on those ovals. Right, and I think a lot of us would agree with that, but uh, you certainly, uh, proved yourself, ended up a triple crown winner in terms of the 500 miles. You have four, I think, four or 500 mile wins under mm -hmm. your belt in terms of Pocono a couple times in Michigan and at, at Indianapolis. Uh, pretty impressive. If you can, you know, I've heard a lot, and in the last year, I've gotten to know Roger a lot better than uh, obviously I knew him before. And it's been really fun to exchange stories with people about their first experiences with, with Roger Penske. 
Um, and then, in fact, drivers, it's been fun to hear about how they got the call and how they knew all of a sudden, oh, my gosh, I I'm going to get to drive for the, the best owner in the history of motorsport. How did, that, how did that happen for you? Well, first of all, it was a very difficult deal because I had had a great year with Doug Sherson. And I've known Doug from back in the Atlantic days, his family, uh, you know, Fran, Molly, all of them, great people. Okay. And uh, Dennis Swan was my crew chief and we had a great relationship. You know, you won three races. And, and so I, I didn't really, but I, I was having a little bit of a sticking point on a contract and Roger called my mentor, Dr. Frank Faulkner, who he knew well. And he says, does Danny have a contract for next year? And he says, I don't know. And you know, I'll find out. And I said, no. And Roger asked me when I was going to be back East next. And he lived in New Jersey at the time. And I met him for dinner in New York. And typical Penske, okay? Meet him for dinner. Very good. You've had you know what I'm talking about. Yep. Very sociable, good, talked a lot about racing, da, da, da. We agreed to terms. He said, would you like to drive for us? And remember at that time, they, they're, they're, they had struggled a little bit after yep. there was a championship in 79. So we agreed to terms. Typical Roger, he had me in the back of the car with his driver over to the offices in New Jersey. <laughs> Go into the table at 11 o'clock at night. They put a contract in, sign the contract, and we're going. But I'll tell you one thing that was great about for him. Okay, so the end of the season, we got a you know release from the contract from Doug. End of the season, before the next race, which was typically March at Phoenix. Okay, I did 52 days of testing. <laughs> 52 days of testing before we ever came to the first race. You know, of course you could do that back then. Now right. it's limited, but Roger wanted it. He wanted me integrated with the team. He wanted everything worked out. He wanted me to feel comfortable with it. I mean, he, and the one thing is, you know, about Roger now, especially in, in the current position, he's, he wants to win almost worse than anybody else, if not more so. And so he leads by example, and uh, you know his drive is is second to none, as you as you know <laughs> intimately. But but the but my point is, those are the kind of guys you want to drive for because they'll they they want to win and they'll they'll do whatever it takes. The hard part is you have to have that same drive and desire. And as Rick told me one time, remember you just got to keep putting numbers up on the board. You yeah. Know? And, uh, as long as you do that, you're in good, you're in good position. So. That, that's, a, that's absolutely true. You know, um, Stephen McLaughlin from Lexington, Kentucky, put, it, it sent a question in and asked about a mentor, and you talked about Dr. Faulkner in there. So hopefully that'll answer that question for you. But Dr. Faulkner played a, had, a, you could, had an influence throughout your entire career, including getting you in a race car, and I didn't realize there was a connection there even to getting you to Penske. Well, Frank was so known in the, in the community but nobody really knew him. He was an independent member of Vacas, but I'd gone to school with his son in the fifth grade and got to know him when they lived in Kentucky. He was an academic pediatrician, World Health Organization, all the stuff. And he had connections in racing. So when I had dropped out of school, he um, asked my family, asking him if they could find him. And he befriended me and became like a surrogate father. Um, and he said one time, what are you going to do with your life? You know, you're going to keep waiting <laughs> tables in New York. And I said, literally as a whim, I said, Hey, I want to go racing. I want to go. I want to, and he, he said, I'm not going to help you. I've lost too many friends. And he talked to Sir Jackie Stewart. He wasn't sir then. And he said, well, send the lad to, to the Jim Russell school, have Jim analyze him, see if he's got any talent. And that's where, that's where it started. So he stayed, he was my mentor all the way through advice, everything, but he had unbelievable connections and actually an Indianapolis connection. He was the guy that put together the Cooper Brabham project in Indianapolis back in the day. And, um, you know, so, but he stayed as long as he was with me. He was always part of the, part of the team. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. Well, and I want to you know thank thank our uh, our listeners for the, for that question. You know, another question, and you touched on it a little bit. It came from Rick in Michigan talking about running for Shearson, and you talked a little bit about what that's like coming in and win those first three races 
um, as well. You know, I'm going to skip over 1985. We've heard the story and we'll, and we'll get back to it. But another, another um, question that we've gotten and I'd actually written down is something I wanted to talk to you about uh, was 1988. 1988 at Indianapolis in particular. Pretty special year for Team Penske. The front row is an all Penske front row. Um, and the first half of that race is pretty special for Danny Sullivan. You go on out, you lead almost every lap. You lead over 90 of the first 100 laps of that race. Um, what about that? Is there any, looking back on that year, I know it's not a win, but was there anything really special uh, about that particular year? And uh, Steve is the person that asked this question. He wanted to know, if you had to compare cars, 85 was pretty special. You spin and you come back and win. But 88, that car was pretty special too. Which was a better car to drive? Well, I think um, both were good. And, but I think the 88 car that was my championship car, it was a really special car. I mean, first to have all three on the front row is not a fluke. You know, even though, you know, with two four-time winners, that's one thing. But it was not a fluke. And at the flag, it, the car was just, it was the probably to this day it was the best car I ever drove um, set up wise that day that doesn't mean it was perfect every every time but remember the wing mount adjuster broke and I hit the, and it collapsed and went into the wall yep but I, I had um, I had Pocono in the bag which would have been a third win at Pocono and we got Mario and I got tied up with Dick Simon and Mario still had one more lap uh, one more fuel stop to go and I was done I had, I had enough fuel to the finish, even Max Green, I could go to the finish. So I was just coming in behind Mario. I wasn't in the pressure to pass him because he had another stop to make. And then I went Michigan with that car. So I could have won all three. It didn't, and there's a lot of people that could probably say that. But I had the car, and it didn't matter if I was on a street course, a road, you know, road course, a small oval. It was just a magic car to drive. And that was the first Nigel Bennett designed car. Um, uh, you know, Jenkins had signed, had done the cars before that, but that PC, so it was a fabulous car. It was just, you know, right. anyway. Well, I hope that answers Steve's yeah, question. Yeah, and that, actually that one was from Ted. That was my fault. Okay. Steve, Steve actually asked a spin off of that. And, and Steve's question was, you know, the spinning part and winning, it really is one of the most spectacular moments in motorsport. Uh, but he asked, do you think the fact that Mario Andretti was involved in that spin and win uh, moment makes it even a bigger moment when you think about how important the Andretti name is across all of motorsport? I, I think for two reasons, uh, it was beneficial that Mario was the guy behind me. He, he didn't panic. He didn't do anything silly. He, you know, he just remained calm and got through, you know, got through the smoke and, and dodged me. So that was, that was the <laughs> first big favor. And, uh, but sure, I mean, you know, it, it wasn't like, uh, you know, and I'm not knocking anybody, but it wasn't like I was just, I spun passing some back marker that just happened to, you know, we were, and we were racing for the lead. It was right at, at the time too. So that added to the, the sort of allure and the history of it. And I think that that made, you know, was a big deal. I, I, I get a lot of the Sports Illustrated cover because I'm, I got, I've made the Sports Illustrated cover. And if you look at the picture, it's myself with Mario, but the guy that's third right behind us is Emerson Fittipaldi. <laughs> so if you really look at it, you go, okay, that's pretty cool company. For, for for me, you know, I mean, those guys are, and Mario was a big influence in my career uh, for a lot of reasons. When he was, when he was teammate to Gunnar Nielsen and and Lotus when he won the championship, Gunnar and I were best friends, and Gunnar never wanted to go to the airport when Mario would come into town, so he'd say, "Take my car." He had a Lotus. <laughs> they take my car. To the so I got to know Mario, and then when, when Gunnar got sick, I was kind of a go-between be, between them, and Mario and I became friends. And he helped me get in the Can-Am seat back in the day at a bar at Riverside at the hotel where everybody was staying. And I was there with m my soon-to-be backer, Garvin Brown, and I'd left to go to take a leak or whatever, and I'd come back, and, and Garvin said, okay, well, let's do something. I said, well, that was kind of quick. And he said, well, Mario said, he said, hey, you need to help this guy out. This guy's got a lot of talent to help him out, you know? <laughs> and so, but you know, again, Mario Andretti, you know, so 
But Mario was funny because he didn't he didn't really want to talk to me much for about a year <laughs> after that <laughs> after that went because he 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 figured he had the dominant car, but he's such a class act and look yep. at all the things he's won and and uh love the guy. So 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 is there a is there obviously spinning is a big memory there, but is there a point during that race when you might have gone from oh I just spun. I don't have a chance of winning to where all of a sudden your mindset turned right back around and said, Hey, I still can win this Indy 500 or was it immediate? No, it was not immediate. I'll tell you exactly when it was some laps later, uh, when I was coming around, I got behind, uh, I think it was Howdy Holmes and Tom Sneva and we're coming down and I'm, I'm getting ready to pass them and I'm coming down that straight away. And I haven't caught Mario yet. I haven't got back to the lead and I'm coming down and I thought, you know, how he late in the race? So I started rolling out of the throttle going into one and they touched. And how he went up and hit the fence and Sneva spun. And normally a car goes one way or the other, you know, up or down when you spin, especially in your in the oval. And I came in there, I mean, literally like this right behind and Sneva, Sneva, are you gonna go one way or the other? And you can't jump on the brakes or you're gonna spin. And right at the last second, he he backed he, he pulled it backed up. I mean, he didn't do it, but it backed right. up that way. And I got by, and I didn't miss him by a half a <laughs> foot. Okay. And I thought when I, you know, got it all settled down, got back and got going, I thought, man, I to, I'm having a lot of luck today. <laughs> but you never think about it. You never think about it. And and you never in any of the races I ever won. I start thinking about it on the last lap, maybe, but seven laps to go. I'm now in the lead. There's a yellow. One of the Whittingtons hit the wall yeah. and there's a yellow. Seven laps to go. And I kept radioing on, hey, my car is overheating. Tell the pace car to pick up the pace. I wanted it to end under yellow. Okay. <laughs> I got Michael behind me and somebody else I don't I don't remember who it was. And Mario. And I yep. thought. Okay, well, they green flagged it with four laps to go. And I was, I backed everybody up coming down the back straightaway because I was not going to get <laughs> overtaken on a restart. And uh, I took off. And ironically, I think my fastest lap of the race was like 198. Okay, yep. 198. I was like, don't look in the mirrors, don't look in the mirrors, just hit your marks, make every, you know, just stay on, stay on. And, uh, I think really coming out of turn four is the only time that you really go, damn, I'm, I'm about to win the Indianapolis 500 because you're just, you're hearing things, you're thinking things, you know, you know, anyway, it was. A so I, I, just expand on that a little bit um, because again, because of what's happened to us in the last year. So um, we affectionately internally call Roger 18. Um, and we know that someday we may have to change that terminology for him. But looking back on your career, I'm going to ask you about two Penske moments. Um, what's it feel like now that you can look back on it to know, and I think Roger, he may not say this, but I think we all believe he believes that his most celebrated victories are those 18 Indianapolis 500 wins, and only a handful of guys could deliver that to him. Um, what's that mean to you to know that you've been able to deliver one of those 18 wins that means so much uh, to Roger Penske? Well, I would agree. I think the Roger, um, his season is about winning the Indianapolis 500 first. Okay. Then after that, then let's win every race and the championship will take care of itself. I think that's the more of the mindset, but the goal is the Indianapolis 500. And, you know, when he had their, uh, one of their big parties for the 50th anniversary and to be there, you know, with Rick and El all the people, Elio, big, you know, everybody, you know, it's a pretty unique club and, and you did it for the captain, you know, and, uh, and that's, that's a, a really special, special deal, you know, and even, even around here, there's a lot of car people, but not everybody knows uh, that much about racing, you know, especially at our golf club, because there's a lot of diehard golf guys and stuff like that. But when you say, well, who'd you drive for? You say Penske. Oh, you drove for Roger. <laughs> you know, and no, yeah. and no disrespect to Doug Shearson, but unless you were a, unless you were a fan uh, of racing, yep. 
you wouldn't know. And, uh, and, you know, of course, it doesn't hurt that his name's driving around on trucks all over the place and, you know, and he's bigger than life and, and so forth. But, yeah, it's a special feeling. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I feel that way. Just the opportunity to have been able to work for him the last 12 months has uh, been a pretty special moment. You know, speaking of Penske and parties, um, your last uh, run with Roger ends up being a win at Laguna, not just a win. I mean, you lead the whole thing um, and you, you celebrated it in a pretty neat way. And, and talk a little bit about what that, again, looking back on it, knowing that the next year you were driving for somebody else that happened to be your last race for Roger Penske, but it was a win. And it was a win in a dominating fashion. And then uh, talk about the uh, bar bill afterwards. <laughs> well, Roger, you know, they weren't going to tell me what they were all doing for design wise or if they were trying to do things for the next year. But, but you know, to his credit, he gave, uh, you know, he didn't cut any corners. I got 110%. Everybody was working just as hard at that race, even though I was going to go as any, anything else. And I decided because it was Laguna Seca in Miami, they used to celebrate the championship. So I thought, well, I'm going to have a, a party to honor my team and my guys and have everybody there. So I, I booked the um, beach club at Pebble Beach for the party. And it was, it was really light hors d'oeuvres and, and an open bar. And um, my bar bill was 17 grand. <laughs> <laughs> Deal. And a yeah, this is 30, 30 years ago. <laughs> and, yeah. and my, and my, uh, I never forget because I knew the manager of the tap room, which is the bar up off the main part of the lodge, and the beach club's a little further away. And I knew him. And so oftentimes when there was a party down there, especially on Sunday night, because they'd close a little early on Sunday night, he'd come down to see if the people were going to filter up to the tap room so he'd keep the tap room open. And he told me afterwards, he came down, walked into the beach, into the beach club, looked at everybody, heard all the noise, everybody, he calls them up and he says, close the doors, shut down, we are closed for the night. We <laughs> not want any of these people coming up here. But it, was a, but it was just a great celebration because the thing at Penske is all those guys are team, they're all family, everybody's worked so hard, we don't win championships you know, by ourselves. And, and of course, Laguna was a race that a lot of people came, like to come to. So a lot of people brought their wives out and girlfriends and stuff like that. So it was a, uh, even my parents left and said, when they left, it was like, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, it's, it's, a, it's looking back on it, it's, a, you know, pretty cool, the things that you could deliver, Roger, but uh, not a lot of people on their, on their last time strapping in a Penske vehicle can say I, I delivered what he asked me to do, which is win races. And, and that's pretty impressive. You know, um, I'm going to change a little bit because one of the things I wanted to talk about, this was really common in, in this day and age, but it was less so in yours. And you were a trailblazer really in figuring out how to take the race car driver off the sports pages and put him on the social pages and the business pages and, and a lot of different places that, that really, help deliver value for the sponsors and the partners. And you understood that. And when I sort of half joked at, at, at the beginning about you being everything, an actor, uh, a TV commentator, uh, celebrity endorser, those were things that you really pioneered in a way that nobody else had. We got a really interesting question. I'm gonna actually read this question because I think uh, it speaks a little bit to how much you care about your fans as well. And then I'd like you to talk, uh, maybe answer that question, but just talk about um, that part of your life and why it was important. And then maybe um, it, it, you're going to hear this question. And I think the first answer is going to be um, because you didn't have social media. It was part of the reason you can answer this, but this question comes from Kyle Wittenberg in Houston, Texas. And I love the first part about, of this question. He says, thank you for giving me the opportunity to submit the question. Danny returned a signed letter to me in the early nineties after I wrote him. And I still have that letter framed to this day. And my question for Danny is, Mr. Sullivan, during your career, you were known as a racing pioneer with product endorsements and having an active social life off the track. From Hugo Boss, Miller, and Molson, your endorsements continued today uh, as I own one or more of your signature uh, Zanto Icon watches. My question is, did your seemingly jet-setting lifestyle ever cause any negative consequences to your racing career? And the reason I laugh about a lot of guys have to be careful what they're posting on social media because they're so accessible, but maybe address that a little bit. But again, I was going to ask the question of, you really were uh, the trailblazer and learning how to not just be a race car driver, but be a business person and an endorser at the same time. 
Well, uh, you guys are all very kind. I think how it started was when I was a gopher for Tyrrell, when I first went to England to go racing, I, I was a gopher for Jackie Stewart and the Tyrrell team. And I learned a lot through Jackie because he was one of the first true professionals, you know, and he said, it's a lot easier to be kind to everybody and sign the autographs. And he told me, he said, have a signature that people can read. He said, not this hen scratch. He said, have something that people can read because then it'll mean something. But two, what happened is when, when I was trying to raise money to go racing, I looked at it and said, okay, if I've got similar looks and I've got a similar personality and, and this, for this guy to this guy to this guy, we're all having similar performances on the track. What will make a sponsor sponsor me over that guy or that other person? And that's when I realized that, hey, I've got to be a better at marketing myself and, and trying to be off of the main pay. Look, we're going to get the cover in, you know, Auto Week or Auto Sport or motoring, any of the motoring publications. Right. Back in the day, Speed Sport News, all the things, Racer Magazine. We're going to get that because we're in the top echelons of the sport. How do I get on People Magazine, US, US, US Magazine, Women's Wear Daily, the stuff that's right. And also the numbers were that women do the shopping, okay? So how do we, how do we, how do we make that, how do we make that deal? And luckily Benetton, after the Grand Prix in Long Beach, Luciano Benetton, I had a translator working for me. And he says, in America, you, get, you have to get Danny a PR agent. And that's how it really started was it was somebody else's you know, Claude gave the idea and it morphed into something bigger. And then that's where all the other endorsements came. And then some of the places I lived, like I lived in LA, so I got the nickname Hollywood. And, you know, if you're in places like that yep. and you're in Aspen, you're running into people that are, you know, so anyway, that's how it, it morphed into it. But, um, but it was really to do over raising, over raising sponsorships. And that's how it started. Did, early. did you ever get to a point um, where you had fatigue from it, where you just didn't, where you got to a point where you didn't um, have a time to yourself. You didn't have that point where you could just relax because people knew you from the racing and now all of a sudden you've become a celebrity beyond that. It was, was there a fatigue from that ever? Well, I, I really maintained my physical fitness. I had trainers early on to try to make sure that I did that because, you know, the travel and the schedule gets you as much as anything else, okay? And so I remember saying to RP after, after the Roger, after went in there and going on three morning shows and all that sort of stuff, I said, look, will you tell me if this is starting to take away from my performance? And he said, don't worry. <laughs> but, it was, but don't forget, it was good for, for him, too, because yep. of sponsors, because they were getting exposure that they hadn't gotten in the past. So you had to kind of find that balance. But I will tell you something that, um, and I was not as anchored as it was with a home. I didn't have, you know, family and all that. So I was a lot more willing to go on the road. But when I won uh, at the end of May, the um, Indianapolis 500, with all the races and the appearances and everything, my first day off after winning in May was December 22nd. <laughs> <laughs> I, I went nonstop. But here's the, here's the thing. There were people calling you up, and a lot of it was really good, and they're calling you up and saying, hey, we want you to open a shopping center, da-da-da, we'll, we'll send a jet for you, we'll pay this, we'll give you, you know. You're sitting there going, okay, you know, and Big Al told me, he said, he said, when you win the first one, he said, make the most of the first one, because you only win the first one one time. You know, now, obviously, if you win three or four, it changes again. But my point is, he said, he told me to make the most of it. So anyway, that was the, that was the story. <laughs> so, so um, in a couple of these uh, responses, you've touched on, uh, two four-time winners. I've touched on all three of them, actually, but two of them in particular, AJ and Al Sr. A lot of people have had an opportunity to be teammates with those drivers or drive for those drivers. Not as many as have had an opportunity to do it in a unique uh, type of racing setting, either the 12 hours of Sebring or the 24 hours of Daytona, and you had an opportunity to do that with both any good 
endurance stories running in an endurance car with an AJ Foyter and Alan Sir Sr.? Well, AJ, what a what a character. I mean, he was I mean, first of all, we don't think about AJ. You know, he he buys these cars and he puts them on out there on the track and he goes and drives them and you know, he could have sat back and just had his IndyCar and IndyCar team and but he was a racer and um uh, you know, and he was tough on on but he was a he was a great teammate but it was funny because not only big al uh and aj and even ari because one year ari line like was aj what uh no um al wasn't there but so ari was in the team and this was at daytona and no, none of those guys want to drive at night <laughs> and i said i think it was ari or maybe it was well i can't see very well at night you know and i was like so i ended up doing you know, all these long stints at night. Uh, I, I loved it, but it was just, it was just characters. Like, really, you guys can't, you know, they, those guys were so much fun to drive with. But the great thing in, with those, with driving with all those guys, you never, ever, ever had to worry about anybody not running fast or not bringing the car back in one piece, you know, ever. Because they just were, they were, but I will tell you a funny AJ story. Okay, I got a good one. I got a good one. That's first. good. Good. So we're we're doing the Miami Grand Prix. Okay, and I think it was about a three. At those days, I think it was about a three-hour race. This was when it was down off Biscayne Boulevard, you know, downtown. Okay. Yep. And AJ's got the um, Columbia Crest. Yep. Nine sixty-two. Yeah. Okay. And I had done Miami Vice, so I got a call, and Don <laughs> Donson wants to know if I can come over and if he could come over and he said would there be any chance to get a ride in the car okay and so you know it's don johnson it's miami vice it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's his town at that time right so he comes over hey i'm going to take him out in the car ag had been in the car and it was at the end of the practice and they were going to give me two laps but the car was warmed up and the tires were warmed up so i put don and i knew don from aspen you know and we had done miami vice so i knew him reasonably well and he put them in and I said, Don, whatever you do, keep your feet because it, they dovetail down into that foot box. Yep. And I said, because if you get your feet tangled up with mine, we're going we're gonna to crash. And I took off out of the pits <laughs> and just stood on the grass. We only got two laps and we're going down and going to Biscayne Boulevard and it's blind. Okay. And I'm going down, you know, third gear, fourth gear, you know, and it's blind. And he's screaming. Anyway, we get back to the pits, get out, of course. It's Don Johnson. It's the press is just <laughs> massive. And he gets out of the left side of the car. The press is all on the other side of the car. And he gets out and he's talking to him. He's got his hands up on the roof and he's got his helmet on. And AJ, clever, clever guy, he says, Don, take off your helmet. <laughs> and Don was like, mm, yeah, I don't want to, I can't repeat what he said even on the weapon. And he, he, he just like this. And he <laughs> couldn't get he couldn't get him, but AJ had him busted, you know. Yeah. And uh, and Don was a good sport about it. He says, "Hey, I'm going. I'm. I'll be back shortly. I got to go home and clean up after that and all that." But but AJ had him dead right. I mean, it was AJ's a character, completely. Yeah. Well, it. Uh, you know, uh, my my friend from college, Chris, and I drove down to the the '87 Sebring race because we wanted to see what the duo. Uh, was going to do in that 12 hour race in that Columbia Crest 962. And unfortunately, I think he had a mechanical and didn't finish. But, uh, right. um, you know, it was, uh, it was my first experience at Sebring. And, uh, and it was really as much because we loved AJ Foyt and Danny Sullivan. And we got in the car and just drove all night to go watch you guys run. Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, another fan question I have, and this is one that I think a lot of uh, listeners may be interested. Um, we have a neighbor, actually, Ryan Pickering, who lives just uh, in the shadows of turn four and is a um, great. Uh, a great uh, cuisine guy around uh, central Indiana. He talks about his first Indy 500 being 1985 and watching uh, from the top rows of the grandstands, watching your race. He can still remember the spin and the win. And, and he's picked up go-kart racing recently. And uh, he did a throwback livery of your uh, 85 car this year in, in go-karting. And he's asked, and I don't know if this is because next year he wants to switch to livery, but um, what was your favorite livery race car that you drove? Do you have one or two that you remember that you really just enjoyed the way they looked? Well, the, the 85 car was really cool with the, you know, the kind of star on the side and the way that it laid it out. But, and I didn't like the 88 car to start with. 
the gold with the green and all that. When I first saw it, I thought, uh, I don't really know. But I ended up loving that car. I mean, and the paint scheme. It really stood out. And, yep. uh, and I, you know, I think that that was one of my, of the Indy cars. Those were, you know, because the Miller car didn't change that much over the course of the year until it became the gold car and uh, the championship car. And that was a, that was a special color scheme. And I, I will tell you this, Roger, when they first proposed it, I mean, Roger really got in there and worked to get the, the green and the red and really make it look, uh, uh, I think the first iteration wasn't that special, but it turned out to be a great car. And so, so um, fast forward just a, a little bit, um, Pinsky days are over. Um, one of the, maybe the more uh, uh, spectacular wins, looking back at it, at least as a fan, knowing what you were saddled with is a Long Beach win that you picked up driving the Galmer. <laughs> um, so the beginning of that year looks like, hey, we might have some luck here. We win. Um, how frustrating was that season? And looking back, how satisfying is it to know that somehow um, you finished fifth in Indy that year, Al Jr. picks up a win, but uh, you also win at Long Beach in a car that, uh, um, that as you look back on, probably um, maybe was a little bit harder to drive than some others. And Detroit. And Detroit. Yes. Yep. Detroit, but, um, and both I had uh, – you know, you know, it was a funny race, Long Beach. Um, but what they, uh, I just saw a video. Somebody was showing me something the other day and said, hey, tell us what happened here at the end. But what they forget is that little Al and I had driven around that race nose to tail for like 80 laps. And then when we went, then uh, Ray Hall and Emerson were catching us and coming down that back straightaway. Um, the... I moved over to the inside because we'd run a kind of run across Hero Masahista and they were jammed up and I didn't want them to get on the inside of me going down there. And of course we were over there and Al was over there because I think he was looking at me. And <laughs> he went on the break, he went on the breaks a little earlier than I was anticipating. Remember, we've been doing this for like 80 laps. So it yep. wasn't like and I was like, oh, and and jumped on and I just caught him. And it was just enough. And it broke the wing on mine, not badly, but it spun him around. And, uh, you know, he was going for five in a row. Right. And, uh, I, you know, so I, I remember the team wasn't real happy with me, <laughs> except my guys were. I, yeah. And Ziggy, Paul Harkus, who's yep. over at Andretti, because um, I think at the breakfast the next morning back in Albuquerque, one of them was like, ah, Damn it! I, 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 that could have been my fifth win. And Ziggy goes, "What well, was mine?" <laughs> there was no brawl or no fight after that. Yeah. But um, but you know, it was just it was great racing. I mean, it was just great racing, and it was close and it was tight. And uh, I got two wins with that, but Al got, got the one at, uh, at there. But the Galmer was not a very yep. uh, pleasant car. It, it had its moments, and when it had its moments, obviously it was capable of winning, but it didn't have them often enough. Well, you know, you know, you bring up an interesting point. I think all drivers go through that. There are points when your teammates, especially when you're running identical equipment with the same team, and you're oftentimes together, and there, you know, those points happen. And uh, you know, I, I asked you if there were things I shouldn't ask, and and I'm going to ask one, and hopefully this isn't. And you said I was fine, so um, I had. Uh, Someone sent me uh, the 1986 Portland video. You're leading a race, and Michael Andretti gets a little aggressive and um, so puts you in the fence. Yeah. Um, and you were pretty animated about that. Um, talk a little bit about how that – how do you balance – I mean, the, the drivers you run with are guys that you see every weekend, and you're friends with you at some level outside of the race car as well. But you guys are all – just like you talked about Long Beach, so competitive inside the car. Um, when moments like that happen, um, what goes through your head? I mean, how do you maintain relationships? And uh, how long does it take for you to put a 1986 Portland behind you and, and be able to look at a guy who, who punted you off and say, okay, we're good now? Well, it's a good, it's a good question. I think it varies depending on um, – you know, the incident, I, I felt that Michael put us in a position that it was a no win and uh, obviously it cost. And the problem for that is 
the, it, for the team to rebuild a car like that, it can be like 800 hours. It's not just getting the bits. It's the man hours it take to put it in there. And you got a good car. Obviously, it was a great car. I was leading. Um, and, and that's frustrating from that. And we didn't, you know, we didn't go and have a beer afterwards or anything like that. Um, and, and I think that that, and I want to come back to that on one thing. I think that's changed in the, in the, in the era when I did it. And I'm not saying the guys were any less competitive. Okay. But the next generation that came after that, the guys like, uh, you know, Jimmy Vassar and Tony Kanon and they were all more buddies. You know, they, a lot of them traveled together, you know, Greg Moore, all those guys, you know, the late Greg Moore, they all traveled together. They were buddies. And, and so um, I don't know whether it, they would recover from that faster because they were friends. Um, whereas we weren't, you know, everybody kind of went their own way after the race and did their own, did their own thing and had their own life and, and so forth. And we didn't mingle except at the track. Um, but you know, we all got over with, with it. And I'm sure there's people complained about some of the stuff that I did. And, yeah. and uh, you know, it, it's, it's part of it. But when you, when you lose a win, but also, I mean, it, you know, it, it moved the barrier back five feet when I hit and uh you know, those are big, there's, I mean, I, I got out of the car, I was fine. I don't mean it that way, but those are big hits, but the damage to it is, is, you know, it's not just, oh, next, let's, you know, roll out the next car. It's a lot of man hours for the team. And, uh, you know, and when you're fighting for points and championship and all that, those, those hurt. So um, I'll, I'll ask uh, one more question and then we'll have a closing question, but this one is really has nothing to do with racing. Um, you know, one of the things about you, I think we've all noticed, I mean, you go 24 hours a day, you go 200 plus miles an hour all the time, uh, and that hasn't changed. Talk a little bit about what's keeping you busy. You aren't just uh, sitting around doing nothing. You've got a lot, awful lot of consulting work you do, and uh, uh, you stay really active. Well, until this year, it was, it's been a little bit different with the pandemic, because normally I would do four or five Grand Prix a year as a driver steward, and then we had quite a few of our aviation business uh, stuff were overseas. So I was still doing about 350,000 air miles a year. This year, my races, one got one that I was supposed to do for Formula One in Vietnam, it was canceled. And I was supposed to be in Bahrain and Abu Dhabi, but uh, it's falling on a time when I'm, I'm, I'm actually moving for the first time in 50, 15 years. So uh, there's not a chance in hell I was going over there. <laughs> I would, I mean, I like it. I enjoy my time out there, but the, but the protocols now are so tough uh, for travel and the, you know, quarantine, quarantine both ways. It's just, you know, at this time it's not worth it, but I'm, you know, we're staying active. We're still doing, working on deals and aviation stuff and never lift. And, you know, we, uh, this is a good area for it. Uh, uh, um, I just saw, you know, Jim Farley from Ford. He was in here the, he, he, they have a home here, so I see them and, you know, try to stay in shape and ride bikes and hike and play golf and stay busy. Which is awesome. I, and, and appreciate that. So last question from one of our um, folks that's online here watching Charlie in North Carolina. He's got a question that I think a lot of us, uh, if we haven't asked it, when we hear this, we're going to go, yeah, I wonder how he feels about that. And his question is, did you ever get tired of announcers repeating the story that you'd been a taxi cab driver prior to your racing career. And it's funny, it, it, they, people talk about it. In fact, I said it at the beginning, we could call you a taxi cab driver. At what point in time, or did it ever, just get to the point where you're like, I don't want to ever hear the taxi cab driver reference again. Well, you know, unfortunately, it's part of my history. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, you, we, in reality, you wanted to talk more about current times and racing and so forth like that. But it was part of the history. And you know, got to do a bunch of different things. Like you said, you know, you've mentioned a lot of them and, and uh, those were opportunities that came up. It's like, you know, going back, um, I get, you'd be surprised how much fan mail I get that people ask me about doing Miami Vice, you know, more, more than the racing. I'm sure Elio about dancing with the stars, you know, type thing. Yeah. Yeah. But when the opportunity came up and somebody says, Hey, you want to do Michael Mann says, Hey, you want to do, you know, M Miami Vice, you want to do a guest thing. It's like, Am I going to turn that down? No way. <laughs> no. What, a, what a fun experience. You yeah. Know? You know, I'm not trying to say I was an actor, but I'm just trying to say, but, you know, it was like, hey, that's really cool. And, uh, 
but you know, I, as my sister said, don't give up your day job, you know, <laughs> and, I, and I wouldn't want to rest on those laurels, but the same thing. But you know, look, it's part of history and I, I, I've enjoyed everything that I was able to accomplish and, and uh, you know, the fans keep reminding me of stuff and, and uh, I get, still get some fan mail and all that. So it's all, all good. What a, what a great, great time I've had. Well, and you've been a great champion uh, for the Indianapolis 500. You're a great ambassador for our event. You're a great ambassador for our sport and certainly uh, for the museum. And we appreciate you taking the time. Although uh, I got to give some credit to Peggy Swalls. I think you and I both know Peggy Swalls picks the phone up and calls either one of us. We're going to do what Peggy Swalls asks. And when, when Peggy yep. asks, we're, we're all 100% in on that one. So uh, absolutely. Um, she is for the, the best. She, she is uh, the best. And for those of you that, uh, don't know Peggy. Peggy's been involved at one level or another with the Speedway or with the museum for uh, a, a long time and, and is uh, just somebody that is as passionate about this sport and cares about the relationships. And that's why she can pick a phone up and call it Danny Sullivan. And Danny, uh, not just because you love the museum, but um, you know, Peggy certainly cares an awful lot about us. Well, I, again, I, I can't thank you enough. On behalf of everybody that's participating here, we're going to post this as my dogs walk in. So if you hear if you hear barking, you're gonna, no, we, I got a big I got a big golden doodle and a little um, a little uh, Italian greyhound named after Kimi Raikkonen, and they uh, uh, they've decided it's time to break down the door. So, um, I hear but you. thank you so much. You know. Um, watching the spin, knowing that the outcome of that doesn't get old for any of us. In fact, it gets more magical every time, uh, every time that we get an opportunity to see it. Um, so thank you for that. 162 laps led at the Speedway, 17 wins in IndyCar, uh, a championship. I mean, you, you've done it all, uh, but what's been most important to all of us, there are times like this where you, you just have always, uh, have always been transparent, shared how you feel, told the stories that uh, make our sport so special. So you are one of those people we love so much. Motorsports Hall of Fame inductee in 2012. I've had an opportunity to get involved with those folks over the last few years and know how prestigious that really is and how much that means for you to be uh, in that uh, in that Hall of Fame along not just with IndyCar drivers but the greatest drivers in our sport dating back to the beginning of it. So so thank you so much um, and mostly uh, thank you to all of you who've uh, taken time out of your evening to uh, spend a little time uh, with our 85 champ and. Uh, it means an awful lot to us. You all are gonna get um, a follow-up survey following this. And really what we're trying to do is get better with these Zoom meetings. So please take a few minutes and fill that out. So be on the lookout for that. It's not spam. It's something that's really important for the museum staff so that they know uh, how to make sure that we're delivering content that's worthwhile for you to spend an hour. Um, and also for us to learn things that you might want the museum to do in the future. As I said at the front end, this is the fourth one of these that they've done. Um, and they're an awful lot of fun. Uh, they've done them in, in person when we can do that in the museum. Uh, but going forward, I think they're going to try and do a mix of both. So please take the time to fill that out. Uh, IndyRacingMuseum.org is the museum's website. And as I said at the start, uh, they live and they survive and they tell the stories of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway because of folks like you. So please uh, get on the website, uh, click that button that says donate. Even if it's just 10 bucks, anything helps. Um, and it really is a great way for you to stay connected with the museum to be sure that you're getting uh, emails and updates of special events like this. Uh, that we're doing with Danny Sullivan. And then once the museum opens, please don't forget, come on in and visit. I mean, there's a lot of great things going on. The From the Vault uh, tour, um, if, sponsored by Bank of America, is a really good, cool opportunity to see all of the, all of the items inside the vault. Uh, the Granatelli uh, exhibit is pretty special as well. And just recently, if you didn't notice, uh, you can spend 30 minutes in the basement of the museum. Uh, the basement is just that. It's a basement. But what makes it special, it's a basement full of cars upon cars upon cars. And it's a great opportunity. Now, for the first time ever, uh, for fans to get an opportunity to go down there and check out what's not on the floor of the Speedway Museum. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you, Danny. Really appreciate it. Uh, everybody stay, stay, stay healthy. Stay safe. We can't wait till we can see you in person in, in a little less than 200 days. We'll see you for the 105th running of the Indianapolis 500.